Hey everyone, it's Harrison. Welcome back to Maine Connects, your source for all things small business and real estate in Maine. I'm thrilled to be joined today by a very special guest that's at the forefront of the housing issues we're experiencing in Maine. If you haven't been following the news, Maine is facing two very large housing issues. One is the supply of housing, and two is the affordability of housing. These are two issues that have their own causes, but also share some that are in common. The first issue is supply. The housing inventory in Maine has historically grown very slowly as the population was generally pretty stable, relatively low growth over a long period of time. As a secret about our amazing quality of life, food scene, natural beauty got out, people started moving here. Then you add on the impact of COVID where people left the big cities for the safety and space of Maine, and we just don't have enough housing for everybody. Some reports show Maine needing nearly 15,000 new housing units to cover the current gap. That's a lot of homes and that takes a lot of time to correct. The second issue is affordability. When you don't have enough homes and people need somewhere to live, prices climb. It becomes a more competitive housing environment. We've also seen an impact on pricing coming from less budget conscious out-of-state buyers who aren't afraid to spend money on a home because they're coming from areas that are already more expensive than Maine. And the growth of short-term rentals. We're seeing short-term rentals pop up in neighborhoods and other areas where traditionally we didn't see them before. We've seen prices in Maine climb at unprecedented rates over the last several years, with some areas appreciating more than 50% in that time. If you haven't looked at the prices for homes or rents lately, you might be shocked at what you see. These issues pose major competitive issues for Maine and its small business community. The availability of housing that is also affordable changes the makeup of our communities and the pool of skilled workers. Housing that is difficult to find and expensive makes it hard for Maine to attract and retain people to the area. Our small businesses suffer because they can't find the employees they need to operate their businesses. Have you noticed how many local businesses have changed their hours, are closed more often, and have a constant help wanted sign on the window? For those people that can find housing, the higher cost puts pressure on their household budget and leaves them less money to be able to go out to eat or go shopping or pay for entertainment, which also hurts our local businesses. Housing is at the core of a well-functioning community and economy. That's why many of us, including myself, are very passionate about this issue. Our guest today is the former speaker of the Maine House of Representatives, where he worked to create affordable housing tax incentives, zoning changes to help create more housing, and increase the investment into trade and vocational schools, all of which are key to increasing our supply of housing. He now serves as a senior advisor to Governor Mills, where he is focused on community development and is working to address these housing issues. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by Ryan Fecto, who is at the forefront of the housing issues we've been talking about and bringing up lately. Uh, welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Harrison. Great to, great to be here. Yeah, so great to have you. So um, obviously, you were the Speaker of the House, and you're now serving as a senior advisor to Governor Mills, focused on community development. Um, so really, a lot of housing things. Your time as Speaker is a lot of housing stuff, <laughs> staying in that housing field, because we've got problems in Maine that are not necessarily unique to Maine, but solving them may be unique to Maine. The housing uh, crunch that we face here in Maine is probably the most prominent issue that on the plates of Mainers across across the state, and that's a challenge that folks are facing across the country as well. So, uh, you know, we're trying to get our arms around it in in our own way, and we're making good progress, but we have a lot more progress to make. It's nice to see that this issue really is a legislative focus. It is a it's a big deal in Augusta. And the, on the private side, I've been in development, I've been in real estate sales, I've been in all these things for a lot of years. And oftentimes it felt like the Augusta wasn't always making it easy for us to move the to move the needle here and bring housing to the market and, and make that possible. And Augusta's really jumped into the fray and, and is working with the private community to try to find a way to get through these issues. Yeah, I mean, we want, we want to be able to drive uh, the solutions in a way that takes some public investment, but also is relying upon you know, private institutions, private companies, and and everyday Mainers to help solve this problem. And you know, that's been the focus of our time and my my time in the legislature when I previously served uh, there, and now in this capacity with the governor's office, trying to uh, really move the ball forward in a way that takes both public investment, which we've made uh, historic investments in. And also uh, put forward some of these private uh, or opening up avenues for the private sector uh, to really be able to do what they do best, which is uh, build housing without 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 bar these barriers in place that artificially reduce our ability to, to uh, bring units to to the market. One of the big initiatives there, and you were right in the middle of it. You sponsored the bill was LD two thousand three, which is you know I talk about it as as it's a kind of a density solution, but 
there's a lot more to LD2003 than just that. So can you can you explain to people what exactly is LD2003 and what is the overall problem you're trying to solve by bringing that forward? Yeah, so LD2003 resulted from a commission that was established a few years ago looking at the impact that zoning and land use policy has on the production and availability of housing. That commission was comprised of a very diverse group of stakeholders from the main municipal association representing municipalities and the folks that serve our communities on a, on a daily basis trying to make good policy, um, as well as the realtor, main realtor association. Uh, we had uh, folks from representing low income communities. We had folks from the agricultural sector. Uh, we had uh, some nonprofit developer representation, some for profit developer rep- rep- representation, uh, and then a bipartisan group of, sta- uh, of legislators as well on both sides of the aisle who served on that commission, ultimately put forward uh, a number of recommendations that were almost in all cases unanimous, in some cases, just a few folks who dissented. And uh, those recommendations were turned into a bill uh, now commonly referred to as LD2003. Uh, That bill was sponsored by me uh, and ultimately passed uh, last year in a bipartisan uh, with bipartisan votes in the House and Senate and signed into law by Governor Mills. It's landmark legislation in terms of reforming zoning and land use. We joined uh, at the time only Oregon and California as states that uh, had a statewide policy that basically prohibits exclusivity for single family home building uh, on, on residential lots. And so one of the key principles or key policies in, included in 2003, LD 2003, is uh, removing the restriction that many communities had that essentially said this residential area, zone, lot, is only, uh, the only permitted use is a single family construction. So you can only build a single family home on the lot. Uh, we get rid of that statewide and we say uh, in this bill, which is a mandate that towns have to allow up to two units, uh, a duplex essentially, if the lot is not served by public sewer and public water. So a lot of our rural areas of the state where there's no public sewer, public water, they can get up to two units on that, on that single family, on that previously single family lot. Mm -hmm. If it's in a area that is served by public sewer and public water, they will get up to four units on that lot. So you could see uh, either a single family home, a duplex, a, a triplex or a quadplex. Um, they have to be in the same structure. So you can't have like four single family homes on the lot. You have to have them all in the same, the same structure. Uh, we, we want, we're trying to avoid subdivision uh, conflicts. If you have a, an existing single family home on the lot, so you've already built the home, you have that single family home on the lot, you could add up to two units um, onto that lot. You could have a detached uh, structure. You could have an attached structure. Um, you could have one of one of each. So an, inta- a, an addition that's an attached structure, adding a unit and a detached structure. The setback requirements, you know, dimensional requirements, all of those things that, that exist under current zoning would still apply. So it's going to be a little bit constraining to realize those two units if you have a single family home already. Um, however, uh, we also passed in that same bill a really opening up the accessory dwelling unit rules uh, to basically allow an accessory dwelling unit, unit to be added without much restriction at all. And so in that case, uh, the ADU, uh, as they're commonly referred to as, um, that can be added to a lot with an existing single family home without much without much uh, restriction, uh, which is which is a huge boost for for families across the state who are thinking about, you know, solving the housing crisis on their own by adding a unit in their own backyard. We've seen the uh, we've seen this backyard ADU concept come up, which is almost like a tiny home ADU, separate structure, yeah, um, sitting on the lot. It's become very popular for because it gives you some separation, but it gives you that additional housing unit. But what you're what you're saying is that if you can fit it, you can actually put a whole nother house on your lot, or a yeah. backyard ADU, or an attached ADU, or a unit that's attached. And in oftentimes we run across a situation where the ADUs are not considered to be like a legal rentable unit. Um, but in many cases now, these ADUs would be a legal rentable unit. Am I correct? Correct. Exactly. It's going to make legal what was previously not, right? You know, being able to 
taking an accessory dwelling unit, you know, over a garage, for example, renovating that space, turning it into a, a livable space with a kitchen and a bathroom and a, and a bedroom, and then being able to rent that out long term to uh, a family member or to someone you don't even know. And we have seen examples of this across the state. For example, I visited a family in Wells who uh, had a, a mo- their, the homeowner's mother was uh, experiencing the early signs of dementia. They looked at a number of options for for her in terms of, you know, long term care. Was it assisted living? Was it you know a condominium? She was living in a single family home. You know, she was definitely had it outsized for for her living situation. Uh, and they considered those options. They looked at the cost. And they determined that the accessory dwelling unit was the least expensive option for them. Mm-hmm. So they added this ADO on the backside of their house. You drive down the street, you would have never known it was there, did not change mm. the character of the community in any way, shape or form. Uh, and then uh, you know, you walk in and you have this beautiful living space for this mom. And you also had four generations living under one roof because mm. on the other side of the wall from that accessory dwelling unit was the daughter of this lady. And then her daughter was, the daughter's daughter was living there. So the granddaughter, and the granddaughter had just had a baby. And so the great granddaughter was, was there as well. So you had four generations uh, living in, in that home. And what a great way to uh, experience aging, you know, being able to mm. age in place, uh, yep. maintain some independence, uh, but also have your family right there. Uh, and we're seeing stories like this um, here, in, here in Maine. And we've, we've seen stories like this across the country, particularly in California, which changed their ADE restrictions back in 2016. And they have steadily seen the number of ADUs being permitted uh, increase significantly. They went from around 4,000 uh, ADUs permitted in 2017 and 2018. Uh, I believe last year uh, they had 52,000 ADUs permitted in the state of California. Wow. Obviously a much larger state, but it just gives you a sense of what's possible now here in Maine uh, with the restrictions reduced, with the barriers eliminated, giving Maine families, everyday Mainers like you and me, the ability to add an accessory dwelling unit in our backyard if we so choose to do so. Yeah, which I think is great. And that example is an awesome one to have all those, all those uh, generations together all under one roof and, you know, what, which creates a great living situation for everybody. But you, I want to touch on a point you made and that was, you know, you can rent this long term. You, mm-hmm. sure, you made sure to specify long term. Because what we see with a lot of ADUs is people are trying to use them as short-term rentals or, you know, something of that nature. And this does not allow those ADUs to be created and turned into short-term rentals. Am I correct? It, it actually does, technically speaking. Uh, that okay. that decision around short-term rental restrictions remains with the municipality. And so okay. we've seen some municipalities adopt restrictions on ADUs being used as short-term rentals, and others have adopted ADU, the ADU provision without uh, restricting the short term rental. Uh, I think, you know, this is a conversation that uh, really needs to happen uh, in communities Mm -hmm. across Maine because short term rentals are having an impact on affordability as well. Uh, When we reduce housing stock for uh, Airbnb uh, type situations, we're, we're obviously reducing the number of long term units that are available. The city of South Portland is coming to compliance with the provisions of. LD2003 around their ADUs, um, they made some really great changes. For example, South Portland previously required two off-street parking spots if you wanted to build an ADU, uh, which is very prohibitive. That's and, tough. And likely the reason why they didn't rel- they didn't have many ADUs being built. LD2003 mandates that towns can no longer require off-street parking for an ADU to be built. So. Uh, they were required to get rid of that provision. They also did some other interesting things. They got rid of their ownership requirement. And in their previous ordinance, South Portland said, if you want to build an ADU, either the primary dwelling or the accessory dwelling must be owner occupied. They got rid of that provision. So now it doesn't have to, be, neither unit has to be owner occupied, but they do impose a prohibition on short term rentals. So I, gotcha. the primary dwelling and the short term dwelling, uh, the, rather the accessory dwelling, they both have to be. Uh, long-term uh, situation. So you have to have a long-term lease for those units, which makes sense. If you're if you're getting rid of the ownership uh, requirement, why does it matter who's living in either unit if the if both units are being occupied over the long term? 
No, it's a great point. It is a great point. And, and that's, I hear a lot of, um, I hear a lot of feedback from people as, you know, especially when they're looking for homes, you know, frustrated by the fact that people are coming in, buying up homes as short-term rentals, you know, and feeling like that's become a, a hurdle for them. You know, these investors mm-hmm. are going to pay more because they can make more and I can't pay that for single family home. And, um, certainly this, uh, ADU option gives people an opportunity to buy that house, maybe generate some rental income, you know, take their cost of living down, solve some of the housing issues by having that available unit. So there's a lot of puzzle pieces that are, that are fitting together here under this, under this legislation. But ultimately the, the flexibility of land use is the part that I've always really liked because it's, it's giving, it's giving the property owners, the landowners, the rights to go and do things on their property that otherwise used to be very difficult, but are also solving the problem we're facing with not having enough housing units. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's opening up real possibilities for families. There was a story in the press Herald a couple months ago about a, a gentleman from New Gloucester uh, owns a property there, currently has a manufactured home on the lot. Uh, mm-hmm. It's pre- a pretty old product. So he, he's looking to uh, move that out. And as a result of LD 2003, he had, he had the ability to rethink the use of that lot. So under the current ordinance in, in New Gloucester, he was prohibited from having an accessory dwelling unit on the lot. He could just build, he only have a single family unit. Now, under the new law, uh, he's quoted in this article saying he's thinking he's going to be adding uh, both a, a home for him and his his daughter, and then he's adding uh, an accessory dwelling unit for his mother and his stepfather, um, mm-hmm. who are, I think, moving back from Florida or moving to Maine for the first time from Florida. And he says in, in the article that he has been working overtime. Uh, he spent the most money he's ever spent in his life to get the framing for uh for the homes mm-hmm. that he's planning on building uh so he's got like penalized uh penalized construction going on and just you know just a very moving story again about what has been made possible as a result of this this law again you have a situation where you know a son is being able to provide for uh his mo- his mother maintaining independence but also having family just around the corner, just across the lot, and, and being able to have that support network. I mean, this is this is really a game changer for for Maine families, both in terms of supporting each other, uh, but also as you as you mentioned, Harrison, it's also about giving people another avenue for for generating an, an income that might keep someone in their home, that might f- be able to uh, help pay the cost of maintaining a home, whether it be just the the general maintenance uh, of home ownership or property taxes, which are are in many cases burdensome, especially for older Mainers, uh, being able to mitigate those costs by thinking outside the box, mm-hmm. adding housing on the on the very lot that you own, is a really important uh, component of of this law and another option on the table for Maine families. And I think that is a really, I think that's a really huge thing because you're giving people. Uh, the power to determine how they solve some of the, the problems that they face personally. And in turn, they're helping solve the problem that we face collectively, which is a housing crunch that is straining people of all ages and all walks of life. There's a lot of uh, a lot of home buyers I've spoken to lately that are, you know, are a little, sometimes a little bit sticker shocked, um, but also looking at the monthly outlay and just thinking, wow, that's that's a lot. Not that rents are much better, but, and a lot of those people I advise, well, maybe a single family home isn't right for you. Maybe a duplex would be better. You know, let's get some income to offset because the price increase from a single family to a duplex isn't significant Mm -hmm. Um, or a triplex because you can still buy them with FHA financing and live in them and, and really, you know, eliminate a lot of your cost of living. But what's nice about LD 2003 is those people that are in that single family home now that may be at the top of their budget have the option to go back and do that retroactively, put that unit back in or put that unit in, add that to the property, generate some income keep their cost of living down. Uh, whereas before, if you didn't buy the duplex up front, you didn't have a chance to go back and get it later. You know, you didn't have the chance to modify your property to find that income. So mm-hmm. I, I love the fact that flexibility is back and you as a homeowner now have options. I mean, we've heard some some horror stories over, over the course of the last few years about <laughs> people trying to add accessory dwelling units, even mm-hmm. though, you know, in, in appearance, the town allowed an accessory dwelling unit. They go through the process and as they do, they find the town making the process very challenging, putting mm-hmm. up requirements that are completely unnecessary. For example, I know of a of a of a lady who had to build a, a garage onto 
her accessory dwelling unit, even though she did, she did not want a garage, but it was <laughs> the town required it. And she took on that additional cost because it was still a more ex- inexpensive option for her, but she had to spend <laughs> unnecessary money just to get the, the town's approval because they were, re- they were requiring this garage. I mean, these are the, the challenges that people are facing <laughs> and they should yeah. have to, you know, these are, these are things that, that really people should have the ability to do with limited restriction. You know, I, I'm not saying we get rid of all the, the requirements that, that exist setback requirements and so forth. We want people to still uh, follow some degree of, of rules that, you know, make our communities what they are, but these unnecessary barriers that, uh, that have been put in place uh, in, in some cases, outright prohibitions. That, that's what this law is accomplishing. It's moving the ball forward in a way that at least at the very least al- allow the accessory dwelling unit to be considered. Let someone put forward a proposal so that your town can, can review it and, and see if it, if it makes mm-hmm. sense instead of having this outright prohibition that basically ends the conversation before it ever gets started. Uh, and we, and we know that right now we have a, we have a housing market that is completely in a stalemate situation. We have an ecosystem that is out of, out of whack. It's mm-hmm. completely out of balance. We have older Mainers who are staying in their single family homes because they're not sure if they put their house on the market, where they'll go. And so they're, they're occupying single family homes that could be on the sale market, uh, up for sale to that first time home buyer looking for their first home, uh, to a family that's moving from other, another state to come maybe because they got a job offer here in Maine. We know of an example in Ro- the city of Rockland. Uh, they had an open uh, position for, for a police chief. They s- provided an offer to someone uh, from out of state. He looked for a home in the Rockland area, was unable to find a home that he could afford as the police chief. He <laughs> was offered the position of police chief and could not find a home he could afford in that area and u- ultimately had to withdraw from consideration. These are the real challenges that we're facing. We have yeah. a rental market tied up, a home ownership market that's tied up, and this is creating a perfect storm of just com- completely uh, stalemating the market. And so when we think about why 2003 was necessary, why some of the other efforts we're undertaking are necessary, it's because we have to be able to shake loose uh, the current the current uh, situation that we have out there. And the best way that we accomplish that is by increasing the inventory. No, I totally agree. And, you know, not to pile on Rockland, but um, I've had many conversations with the person with the Coast Guard that does a lot of those, um, a lot of the uh, transfers and then, fi- you know, helps find housing. Um, and that's the Coast Guard has a difficult time right now bringing people to Maine because they can't house them. There's not mm-hmm. enough housing in, in Rockland or South Portland or Booth Bay, all the areas they typically put people, you know, yeah. so now you've got the Coast Guard is struggling to be able to relocate people to Maine to work. <laughs> you know, work along our coast, protect our coast because they can't find a place to house them. And it, you know, the police chief's a great example. The coast guard's one I've talked to many companies that are struggling right now to hire, attract and retain um, because they don't, they, they can't find housing for them. So they're putting them up in very expensive executive rentals for a period of time, hoping that they'll find something, but even that's not a guarantee. And um, you know, a, a big piece of Maine's competitiveness in our economy relies upon being able to attract and retain Mm-hmm. a talented labor pool, a talented workforce. And it's very hard to do that when they've got nowhere to live. As you probably know, uh, Rockland had the largest uh, increase in median home price in the mm-hmm. state last year. They went f- yep. from 2021 to 2022. They had a 41% jump in median home price. They led the state <laughs> and, and all, in the wrong way, I guess. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and that's having a significant impact on, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, recruiting uh, employees up there and, and, and so forth. And so in Rockland, uh, you know, neighboring Camden, Rockland was considered the, for a long time as the affordable community to live in, you know, outside of Rockland. Right. And so you're seeing this, this interest, which is, which is really happening up and down the coast of Maine uh, with property values uh, and communities along the coast, increasing costs of, of housing rising, and in the coastal communities. And so that is creating a, a, a real challenge, particularly in the tourism industry, uh, which we mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, there's so in the summer, so many people coming to Maine, visiting our, our beautiful coastline and our communities. And 
Uh, you, then you have restaurants and hotels that are uh, are really in a pinch to find workers and to find housing for them uh, mm. because the housing is becoming more more limited in, in those coastal communities. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, one of the topics I want to I want to pivot to because we've been talking about it a little bit is is getting into some of the housing types. Um, you know, we've talked about ADUs. You mentioned somebody utilizing a modular, and we've got a, a great case. I believe it was Bangor that repositioned a mobile home park into a mm -hmm. tiny home community. Um, that's an ongoing project, and we're seeing tiny homes have been added to the development of the uh, of the downs, the Scar uh, Scarborough Down site. And we're see we're beginning to see other types of housing pop up: more condos, more higher you know type sort of high rise type apartments, tiny homes, modulars, trailers. There's a lot of a lot of options. What's your opinion on housing types? Is, is there an option in here to diversify the type of housing we have in the state of Maine to help with this issue? It's paramount. I mean, we need we need to be able to provide a mix of options for for folks and uh, modular offsite construction is, I think, a really important piece of this of this conversation. As you probably know, Maine has one offsite construction company that's building manufactured housing. That's KBS out in South Paris. They are at capacity, is my understanding. They uh, they have two empty facilities, but they at their their operational facility, they are very busy and they're making a lot of they're building a lot of housing. They're building a lot of uh, customized housing for that's a little bit more on the higher end. We even need to fill the gaps in, in between uh, higher end housing and and you know your standard HUD, HUD code housing, and, and that's really something that uh, I think we're interested in in, in this in this administration is figuring out how we might. Um, be able to spur more production on, on the offsite. And we're seeing some great projects. You mentioned that the tiny home project up in Bangor, uh, that housing is being, uh, is being built offsite in part by uh, where Butler supply that they have a facility in old town that uh, is basically doing panelized construction. Um, so they're, they're delivering those, those panels to the site and able to erect the structure uh, pretty quickly. Um, obviously they're not, doing what KBS does, which is build, build, build the entire house from start to finish inside a warehouse setting delivered to site. And, um, you know, you're, you're only doing basically your hookups to electric mm. and, and the plumbing and so forth. Um, whereas the, what's, what was done in Bangor is a little, still involves having to do the plumbing on site and the interior, uh, construction still has to be completed, but, uh, just, a, you know, some great examples of d some diversity and what's, what's possible. Uh, and what we need. And, and frankly, we have a cost <laughs> challenge, especially right now with, with the, the material costs that exists for, for construction. So figuring out ways to be more efficient with building, um, to be able to think a little bit more outside the box is another great company, Opal Build in Belfast. They're, they're doing some CLT construction. They're getting, uh, they're getting CLT, uh, I think from Austria. You know, really, really impressive uh, work that they're being that they're doing out, uh, out in Belfast. Of course, they're working across the state. Uh, there's another company in Rockland that's uh, building with straw material, which is an <laughs> another interesting uh, another interesting approach. And uh, they're they're also doing panelized. So we have we have some panelized constru construction. We have some offsite complete, you know, manufactured uh, housing construction. We have obviously on, plenty of on-site, and so we need this this whole ecosystem uh, to be to be fully in play. And I think we have a lot. I think we have some more work to do uh, to spur more of those um, innovative approaches to housing construction. I actually was uh, in D.C. a few weeks ago at the HUD Innovative Innovative Housing sh Showcase and had the opportunity to see some really innovative approaches to housing construction. Uh, including a company out of Las Vegas, Las Vegas called Boxable, uh, and mm. they're building uh, basically boxes that fold fold down, and they're able to ship them across the country. They were, you know, I walked into, I was not expecting when I walked into that into that unit from what it looked like on the outside to ex experience basically, you know, a very livable, very nice space. I was very very surprised. We also know that University of Maine is. Uh, exploring 3D printing with bio-based materials. So yep. there's a lot of good things happening and we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to innovate in this industry. Yeah. The innovation is key because as we all know, we have a, and when it comes to the trades, we have a, we don't have a huge labor pool for the trades here. 
and a lot of your tradespeople are begin are aging and they're think starting mm-hmm. to think about retirement. There's just not enough people to backfill them. I was involved with the Maine Blue Collar Scholarship Foundation for several years, and their focus is on giving out the scholarships and toolships and apprenticeships to help students get into the trades and hopefully stay in Maine and continue to work there. But even with all the work they've done, and Sean Moody was heading that up, we still can't seem to get enough tradespeople. You know, there's these construction firms are fighting over that labor pool. Uh, because of it, we're seeing the costs go up. But what you're talking about, the innovation in different construction types could actually reduce some of that labor need so you can actually produce more units even with a with a smaller labor pool, which we've never really had that solution at our fingertips before. Everything here has always been traditionally stick built. Yeah. It was stick built, it was big crews, it was long timelines. And now we're talking about, you know, manufactured off of a line or panelized. It shows up in pieces, you assemble it. It's a, it's a much different construction type that I think everybody thought with Maine being cold and snowy, you couldn't do. <laughs> but what we're learning is you can. There's a lot yeah. of other construction types available to us. Yeah, exa- exactly. And, you know, I visited KBS a few months ago and just seeing what they're doing there. I mean, another important component of, of the offsite construction is they're building, they're building the housing from the inside out, which you don't mm. have the luxury of doing when you're doing site built. So there's also an efficiency, an energy, an energy, energy efficiency component to this conversation that I think is really important. And, and being able to seal every single part of that home, you know, being mm. able to see where the gaps are. Because you're not in a rush to close the envelope up uh, because of the elements, the weather elements that exist mm-hmm. when you're doing on-site construction. Uh, you know, that's another another important part of the conversation from, an, uh, from a mm-hmm. long-term affordability perspective. Not leaking energy <laughs> out of your home mm-hmm. is, is really important. And, you know, KBS is proving that they can uh, do some things that you don't have the luxury of doing when you're, when you're building on-site. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, to your point, it, it really is a matter of, being able to diversify um, how we build housing and uh, not that any one type is better than the other, but it's important that we, that we have the ability to rely on different types of housing construction because we, we need uh, to have the production ramping up and staying. We need to, we need to keep it going. And that, that means we need, we need to be able to have different types of housing being built. Uh, Otherwise, you know, we're just not going to be able to maintain pace with with the demand with the demand that exists out there yeah no i totally agree and innovation is the is the key to this industry because it's an industry that has been very much the same for a hundred plus years and and now we're really you know i would say testing it and breaking it um and finding out that there needs to be something differently different done there but another point i I would i would make and i'd be curious on your opinion of as as we're seeing more of these you know the back end of the millennial generation the generation coming up behind them getting into the housing market what we're learning is that they don't want the house they grew up in. They oftentimes don't want the big colonial with the two-car garage and the yard. They want efficient, flexible housing located not in the subdivision, but closer to amenities. And we're beginning to find that not only do we not have the inventory in terms of the supply, but oftentimes we don't have the inventory in terms of the demand, the, the desire, You know what the housing type they really want. But then that's where a lot of these condos and tiny homes begin to fill that, fill that out because that younger generation doesn't want that big house that has to be filled and cleaned and heated. Um, mm. Are you finding some similar trends as you're digging into this industry? You know, I think I think we're we're fi- we're finding that the the need is pretty much across the board. I think one one particular challenge we have is starter homes and you know mm. that first that first entry point. And we actually created a program using some of the American Rescue Plan dollars we received for uh, a home ownership program that l- was a lower cost, 100 uh, to qualify you had to make 120 percent of area. In- Median income. Um, that program has uh, sp- spent most of the funds. We've we've deployed most of the funds that that we allocated um, in seven locations across the state. Um, so, giving that point of entry into home ownership, I think, is is really important. I think to your point, it's a smaller, more compact footprint. I think that that you're looking at th- that compared to these larger homes. I mean, we know that family. Family sizes are changing, right? Uh, a mm. good example of this is in, up in Ashland, uh, in Aroostook County. Um, you wouldn't think of uh, a town in, in Aroostook as having a housing crunch, but Ashland is a is a is home to one of the big parts of Irving's operation up there. Uh, Irving right. is struggling to find housing for their employees, and interestingly, Ashland conducted a housing survey, a housing study, a few years ago, and they found that they had actually issued more demolition permits than they issued building permits. Uh, and wow. so 
it's also one of the challenges we face is the supply that's coming offline because we have the oldest housing stock in the nation mm-hmm. and we have housing stock that is no longer suitable for living. And so demolition permits are getting issued. We're taking housing offline. And Ashland also found that the, uh, that the housing formation, the family formation has declined, has decreased. So they went from, I think, around 2.6 uh, people per household to 2.1. Which doesn't seem like a lot. It was a, but it was a very short period of time that that mm-hmm. decrease occurred. And that 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 difference, uh, that is, that is substantial. That's substantial when you think about, uh, leveling that across households and what right. that means in terms of supply. When you have fewer people living together and you have roughly the same population size, or even in, our, in Maine's total case, a gr- we actually have a growing population for the first first time in quite a while. Um, that means we need more homes. Uh, so, you know, I think p- part of the misconception that we have around in this conversation is people will say, well, we have the oldest population in the country. We've had a declining population or at least, you know, uh, status quo population size. How is it possible that we need more housing? You have, you take two, two key components. One, housing, su- household size has decreased. And two, we have old housing stock and a lot of it's coming offline. And, and we, we have, we haven't built nearly enough ha- new housing to keep up with demand. So it, it is, it is absolutely um, the case that even with a status quo population size, if we, if we revert back to pre pandemic levels, we will still need to keep production of housing ramp, ramped up because of what we're seeing with household size and de- demolition permits. That's fascinating. So you think about a half a person, if you only have a hundred households in your community and you've got half a person from each one that's now living separately, that's 50 people. Right. If they live two to a house, that's 25 homes. That's an entire subdivision. Um, exactly. exactly. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but that half a person, to your point, our population is not declining. That half a person isn't, isn't not here anymore. <laughs> right. They're just living somewhere else. And that, exactly. that does, that puts a massive demand on, on housing because over a hundred households you're talking, that could be 25 additional units needed, which again, doesn't happen overnight. That's a lot of houses. And in Ashland, the 25 house subdivision, that's a big project. Right. Exactly. It's huge. It's huge. Ah, that's, and, that's and, and so I, th- I think for a lot of young people, they are looking for home ownership opportunities where mm. the homes are smaller because they're planning on living alone, you know? Mm. Um, and, you know, we're not seeing people raise big families anymore, you know, with four, five, six kids, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different, the household formation has changed, which, yep means our housing stock has to reflect that change as well. Yep. Yeah, I saw a, uh, I saw a report was, was released by NBT Bank, and I believe they worked with several other banks looking at uh, housing trends. And I believe the numbers they came out with was across the country, we're like 4 million housing units short. But in Maine, we're potentially up to 15,000 housing units short. Um, you know, do you have some semblance, some idea of a number that you guys are thinking we're short? Or yeah, you, just, we, we... you just know we're short and you're trying <laughs> to throw everything we have at it? We've, we've been using 20,000, which is, which is okay. based on some, some surveys from some larger companies such as, uh, or sorry, larger organizations up for growth, for example, has a national, uh, underproduction study that they, that they produce. Um, and they've listed Maine as needing 20,000 units of housing. Uh, with that being said, uh, we are actually undergoing the process right now of working with a company called HRNA. Uh, Maine housing is contracting with them to produce what will be easily the most comprehensive study of housing needs in Maine, in Maine's history. Uh, and we wow. expect that report to be produced and published around early fall. So uh, we're, I've seen a preview of some of their, of their findings. And uh, all I'll say uh, as a teaser here for your, uh, for your program is, uh, is, is that there's some really fascinating data that, that they've, um, that they've pinpointed and, I think it will be very illuminating for those of us who have an interest in this conversation um, from like just a anecdotal perspective, but also mm. uh, I think very informative as to how we tackle the challenges that we face. Um, and, and one thing that we haven't uh, touched upon is climate migration also is an, is an important part of this mm. conversation. And yep. I'm reminded of, of this because of one of the things that they point out in their, in their study, but we have people who are, who are going to be probably moving across the country to come live in Maine mm-hmm. because of the challenges they, they face in their, in their current states. You know, we've seen insurance companies pull 
coverage for homeowners in California uh, due to wildfires. We know that's been a persistent issue for homeowners in Florida. Uh, we can see where climate uh, risk is highest uh, uh, across the country. There's a great uh, uh, there's a great map that was released by a company uh, a few months ago that shows the highest risk counties across the country. Um, none of them are in Maine and hmm. mo- none of them are in New England uh, in terms of high risk. And so you have to wonder what that might look like in the future. And it also might look uh, like people moving from our coastline in uh, into the interior parts of our state. So climate migration might occur, uh, is likely to occur nationwide where people move from one state to another to, to uh, seek relief and rep- uh, reprieve from whatever uh risks they're facing, whether they be wildfires or hurricanes or flooding. Uh, but they also might look like people moving from uh, within within their states, so from coastlines to more interior com- uh, components of their of their existing states. So we have to think about those things as well mm. uh, when we think about these issues. Yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So we got a, we got a few more minutes here, Ryan, and I know there's a variety of programs that you're working on right now that are helping with housing, but also affordable housing. Could you discuss some of the kind of the big programs you're focused on right now to continue to to deal with these issues? Yeah. So so we we launched uh, well we, in 2019. I actually it was a sponsor of legislation that created the state's version of the low income housing tax credit, which of course exists at the federal level. Uh, by creating this program, we're able to leverage. Um, some federal dollars that are not available to states unless uh, you have your own state state credit. Um, that program at the time was the single largest investment in housing in state history, $80 million over eight wow. years, so $10 million per year. Since that time, the governor uh, and the legislature have actually allocated more money towards that low-income housing tax credit. Uh, last year, we put $50 million, I think, uh, roughly $50 million uh, towards uh, towards that that program. Uh, we put 30, uh, $35 million uh, into uh, a new rural rental housing program. Uh, so this is a little bit different than, than LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Uh, LIHTC is more larger, more larger family, multifamily housing. So you're, you're okay. thinking about like more 30, 40, 50 plus uh, unit housing. Uh, that obviously doesn't work in all areas of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we wanted to create a program that was still multifamily housing, still creating rental opportunities, but at a, at a smaller scale. So five to 18 unit uh, housing structures. And that's been a very successful program. We spent all the money, tw- which was $20 million initially. And in this current state budget, that's before the legislature, uh, another $35 million is being allocated to that. Also another $35 million to LIHTC. So uh, we've made huge investments <laughs> Yeah. in housing. And I, I, you know, I think just to give you a real sort of demonstration of where we're at, we, we've we made uh, a total investment at the state level uh, with public, with our public dollars and the private dollars that come to play. Because all, all of these, these, these dollars that we put forward at, at the state level uh, requires some private investment as well. Sure. Uh, in totality, we're looking at roughly $1.2 billion of activity uh, as wow. a result of investments we've made since 2019. Um, we have 456 units that have been completed since 2019. We have 1,055 units that are under construction. There are still 1,400 uh, units roughly that are under consideration and in review by Maine Housing. Uh, and so we have really empowered uh, some real change. Uh, the dogs have to ruin the end of this. Huh? So, ju- you know, just just in conclusion, we've been able to make some pretty big, big investments that are uh, bringing units online and allowing us to really tackle the challenges that we face. Yeah. I mean, and what you just, you know, kind of tallied up is close to 3000 units um, between what's already been done, what's, what's under construction and under consideration. That's, that puts a pretty big dent in that housing number in a relatively short window of time. Uh, And coming from the development side myself, I, I know that, you know, the only way to get these units, get the cost down is that bigger, as you mentioned, the bigger multifamily building size, you know, you need to be able to get more units under one roof, uh, one set of walls, so you can keep that cost down and bring these to the market in a much more affordable manner. Exactly, and this and this is only accounting for what we have been uh, part of at, mm. at the, with public investment. It doesn't include what's uh, the private activity that's occurring across the state, which we know is is also significant. The Downs is a great example of what's what's happening, um, and pro- there are numerous projects across the state that uh, the private sector has has undertaken. So, 
uh, we we are making headway, but we're still uh, we're still short of where we need to be, and I think that keeps us all motivated uh, to continue to make uh, the the necessary investments and the necessary changes to the rules uh, that have created barriers to getting housing online. And so, uh, together with investments and reducing the barriers, I think we can make uh, a real strong case for Maine being a leader in the nation for addressing the housing crunch that we, that we're currently, currently experiencing. Yeah. And, and as a Mainer, you know, I, I appreciate everything that you're doing, everything that, that Augusta is doing, uh, the attention that's been brought to this because, you know, we're seeing it every day up and down main street, you know, we're seeing clients where I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people that are, that are struggling you know, that are trying to figure out how to make this housing situation work. Rents are too high and there's no homes for sale and the prices are too high. And, um, what I love hearing you say is the fact that like, we know there's a problem. We're working to address it. Um, we are finding creative ways to address it. We're investing against it and we're trying to take the barriers down to make this easier because ultimately if, if we don't all work together on this, um, we're going to continue to dance around this issue for entirely too long. And at least now everybody is, we're all in the ring together, yes. um, you know, trying to fight this fight. Yeah. It's a, it's a collective responsibility. And I think that's uh, a real a really strong component of LG 2003 uh, is this recognition that no one community can solve the housing crisis mm. alone. Uh, we can't rely on the Portlands of the world to uh, be the community that houses every single person who is looking for housing. Uh, every single community needs to have some contribution and it may look differently for every community, right? Like there, we, sure. have, we have some small communities in our, in our state. I'm not expecting you know, uh, communities in Franklin County or Oxford or Piscataquis to be building uh, and taking on thousands of units to help solve this problem. That's not that's not what we're talking about here. But we're expecting every town to make some kind of contribution, whether it be two, three, four, five units, uh, bringing those units online. Uh, if we can do that across the state, bring uh, uh, just a few new units online in every community, and in some cases hundreds of units, depending on the size of the community, we can really get our arms around this problem. And I think we will. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that outlook. The fact that it's every unit counts. Uh, we're all in this together. And and ultimately, there's enough attention and focus on this now that we feel like we can we can take care of this issue. It certainly won't be an overnight fix, but at least we're, we're trending in the right direction. Exactly. Exactly. We're moving. We're moving the ball forward. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> we're building the house. Exactly. St which is all we can do. Stick by stick. If people want to learn more about, you know, what you're up to, what's going on in Augusta, especially around housing, um, what are some resources they can look towards? Uh, well, they can always follow me on social media, which I try to provide frequent updates on, on housing. So okay. at Ryan Fecto on uh, most platforms. And uh, we also, we also uh, have a website, uh, uh, at main.gov main uh, and GoPIF is the name of our office, uh, Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. So if you search GoPIF Main, uh, you can find um, information about our office and the work that we're doing and information about the housing uh, that we're working on. And also Main Housing uh, is, a, is obviously a, a significant resource. It's a quasi-state agency. We run most of our housing programs through Main Housing and you can find Main Housing at mainhousing.org. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate the time, Ryan. I appreciate all the efforts you've you've put forth over the years for this issue and everything you're working on now and look forward to seeing uh, where we go. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for all you're doing as well. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan.